Good evening, everyone. We'll get started in just a few. We're just waiting for everybody to get into the event um, for, for Paul Dixon and his new book tonight. All right, that should be good. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to PNP Live. My name is Beth, and I'm an event coordinator at Politics and Prose. We thank you so much for joining us here tonight to celebrate the release of Paul Dixon's The Rise of the GI Army, 1940 to 1941, the forgotten story of how America forged a powerful army before Pearl Harbor. At any time during the event tonight, you're going uh, to be able to click on the link that I just submitted in the chat to purchase a copy of tonight's book on PNP's website. You can also ask the author a question tonight by clicking on the Q&A button, which is found at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to submit your question in that Q&A box and not in the chat um, so that your author sees it. Uh, on to the main event. Paul Dixon is the author of now exactly 70 nonfiction books, including Sputnik, The Shock of the Century, and The Bonus Army, an American epic, as well as books on electronic warfare and war slang. He concentrates on writing about the American language, baseball, and 20th century history. Paul, welcome tonight. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's just a pleasure to be here. And, uh... I should start out by saying that I was, uh, I was born on July 30th, 1939. Um, and I'm gonna just pick up my picture here, which I'm sort of lost, but um, uh, let me start over because I'm, I'm having a little trouble seeing myself here. Okay. Um, I was born on July 20, 30th, 1939, which was uh, exactly uh, one month, one day, from uh, two events that changed the history of the world. Uh, one was the beginning of World War II. It was September 1st, 1939, that uh, the, the Nazis invaded um, uh, the people of Poland and Poland fell within weeks. And the World War II was, was totally underway. It, was, it, it, it had really started in earnest. Um, the other uh, event that happened that day and is less, um, less well known generally, but is highly significant in terms of 20th century uh, history, is that George C. Marshall was picked as Army Chief of Staff. Um, and, and those two events are really what my book is all about, is how we got from uh, the, the, a very, very small, insignificant army in, in, in the, at the day of the Poland was invaded. And only the army only had, we were the 17th largest army in the world after Portugal. Portugal had got a larger, larger army than we did. In 1935, there, the whole United States army was only 118,000 men. And that then Chief of Staff Douglas MacArthur said that, um, that the whole army could fit into, fit into Yankee Stadium. They'd be standing up, but the whole army of the United States could fit into Yankee Stadium. And then he threw in, and they weren't prepared for anything. The army was, at that point in history, a disaster. It was falling apart. Um, the men were paid almost nothing in the late 30s. Uh, the, there are many examples of how bad it was, but I'll give you one really telling example. If you were, went in the army in 1936, 37, 38, uh, and, you, and you wanted a gun that worked, a rifle that worked, you had to pay for it. You had to pay over $200 for a calibrated rifle. If you don't want to pay, buy the rifle for yourself, you got a rifle that didn't necessarily work. That was just an old, it hadn't been cleaned, hadn't been this. And it, so it was this, it was this colossally weak um, sort of Achilles tendon in America. And so I was always concerned about how did we get from um, that, this lousy army that was very small, unmotivated, low morale, ill-paid, you had to pay for everything, you had to pay for your own uniforms. Um, going back to World War I, if you, if you were shot and, and, and lost your leg, um, you had to pay for a new pair of pants. I mean, you, they didn't give you an extra pair because you might have lost the leg of the pants along with your leg. It was that grotesque, it was that, it was that unbelievable. And um, just a, a, a sort of a background by, by my saying that I was born that early, I was born in 
on uh, uh, July 30th, 1939. Um, for all my life, I've been, be, been looking for a story to tell about World War II. Um, World War II for, for me was being a little kid. And um, it was a fascinating time. Uh, my parents got Life Magazine and Look Magazine. So even before I could, which were intensely pictorial magazines. So even before I could read, uh, I was looking at pictures of the war and horrified by them. I had two beloved uncles, both of whom were in the South Pacific, or in the Pacific, both in combat zones during the war, one in the Army Air Corps and the other in the, in the, in the Navy. And um, the whole war to me was, was fascinating. And, and, and I tell kids today, my grandchildren said, you know, that, that there were no toys because Fisher Price, which everybody knows makes all those wonderful wooden toys and pull toys, and they were making ammunition boxes. American Flyer and Lionel were making um, weapons. They were making instruments. They, they were not making electric trains. So all of that stuff was sort of off the, off the board. And for my whole life, I've been reading about World War II and being interested by it and, and wanting to find a, as a writer, because I write narrative, and, and I, I wanted to find a narrative that hadn't been told before. And, it, and I started playing with this idea in about 2005. And the idea, I, I kept, couldn't get over the fact that most people, and I have many examples of people who believe this, most people thought that when we were attacked at Pearl Harbor in 19, December 1941, that we built this huge army, that we built this huge army almost overnight and we're ready to take on the, the Nazis in North Africa less than a year later. But, but um, it was it was it, it was an amazing feat that, that it took place before the war. The, the, everybody was saying that we didn't build one until after the war, and this included some fairly well-known writers who sort of said, "Well, we really didn't have any army before World War II, before Pearl Harbor." And I I got really fascinated with how this occurred. And once I got reading, thinking, and, and researching, and years of research sort of went into this. I found this story, it's almost a miraculous story of how um, uh, Marshall, George C. Marshall and Roosevelt and a, and a civilian named Grenville Clark, who very few people have heard of, Grenville Clark, um, they created a draft for 1940. They realized that we'd have to fight this terrible war in Europe. We, we knew about it in Europe uh, especially, <clears throat> that that was, that was facing us. But we also knew that we were um, just totally unprepared for it. So we needed a draft and, and Clark and several other people, civilians started pushing in, in, in uh, 19, early 1940 uh, to start a draft. And um, the, there was real, very little support. The United States did not want to go to war. Isolationism was huge. A lot of people felt that we'd been really burned by World War I. Um, there were still people in the streets with inhalers from gas attacks in World War I. There was still a huge number of World War I severely wounded still in veterans' hospitals. Uh, we, we didn't want to get sucked into another European war. But Clark and, and several other visionaries realized that it was inevitable, that we had, two, we had enemies on two sides, in Asia and in Europe, that basically were aggressive, that basically would come after us. And Clark at one point said that, he envisioned a time when after, after, after the Nazis had taken over all of Europe, had conquered uh, Britain, had conquered France, that they were, there would be Nazi troop uh, ships that would come up the Potomac, take Washington, move to Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and take over the country. And there were the same fears uh, in Japan where the warlords were in control and, and they, were, they were already aggressing in China and other places. So um, by getting this draft thing through, which is an, almost a miracle, Clark, uh, uh, even Roosevelt wasn't sure he wanted it at first, but he realized, Clark and these others realized they had to get this done. And um, on September 20th, or in June 20th, 1940, there was introduced as legis uh, in the legislature in the House and the, in the Senate. And it finally, finally passes by a very slim margin uh, in October of 1940. So we start drafting, we start bringing, there's a registration per day, and we start drafting people in the fall of 1940. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men, I say men advisedly, because they're the only ones drafting, 
were brought into the army. And uh, these people were, uh, th there was very, very few exception, exemptions. And it was a fascinating process because Vanderbilts, Roosevelt's, Rockefellers, the head of the New York Stock Exchange, all these people were, were drafted. They were just pulled into this, this massive draft. And uh, remarkably, there was grumbling and some people didn't want to go. Uh, but there was, there was, there was, even if you compare it to state of the resistance to masks, it was minor compared to that. People said, all right, uh, I, I'm being yanked out of my life as a, whatever, a bank president or a, or a barber or, or whoever I am, out of my, out of my life, uh, and I'm being sent, I'm being sent to some godforsaken base in the middle of nowhere, often in the far west of the deep south where there were virtually no recreation uh, facilities and paid 21 bucks a month. And um, that, that, that was an extraordinary uh, uh, event in terms of building this army. But, but once we got to these bases, we had to decide what to do with these guys. And that's where the genius started to come in. And again, this is all being done with a huge resistance by the part of the isolationists. They, they are um, absolutely convinced that we are uh, stay out of the war. They don't even want an army. They want to rebuild the Navy with the assumption that we are, would protect our shores and that's all we really have to do against both the Asian and the, and the um, European uh, threat. And um, George C. Marshall and others with him, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt had put together an amazing war cabinet, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, a, a Republican. Uh, he knew, Roosevelt knew that in order to win the war that was coming, that he knew was coming, that he had to create a bipartisan, a very strong bipartisan uh, uh, set, uh, series of leaders. Uh, so Stimson is his key man. Stimson's a, a, a brilliant man, anti-New Deal, but brilliantly uh, uh, and, and very patriotic. Knox, who was his secretary of uh, the army, uh, was, a, was again a, a Republican. And so these guys, and again, there's this fierce American first movement, which is trying to stop all this. Um, they start to build this army and, 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 and um, there's a brilliance that Marshall has. Marshall has worked with the, the uh, CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, he'd been working with them for, for years. And um, the CCC may in fact have saved the army because when Roosevelt put the army in charge of the Civilian Conservation Corps, he kept he get to keep his, his officer corps. But once they get, uh, and, and so Marshall has to learn to discipline my men. And so does Omar Bradley. So all of the leaders of World War II are learning how to run groups, large groups of men without punishment. The CCC were volunteers. They were out there to plant trees and build golf courses and things like that. Um, so these guys had this ability to sort of, they, they, they understood morale. Uh, uh, and Marshall immediately saw that he had to build a strong morale. And he puts out a thing called the Soldier's Handbook, which sounds like a, a small thing, but it, it tells him this guy, these citizen soldiers, these are not professional army guys. These are you know, citizen soldiers, how, how they could become uh, a cohort, a, a, a unified group, he even puts together a slang dictionary. So they have their own slang and, and anyone who knows anything about language knows that slang and jargon create a, a feeling of unity within a group. Um, and, and, and there's this brilliance in, in, on Marshall's part. He, he's worried about morale. He's, these bases are being crowded with huge numbers of, of people. And just one example, he, one day he just really is starting to worry about it. He gets on a plane, a uh, little one engine or a two engine plane and goes down to one of the bases in civilian clothes, dressed, uh, goes into the, one of the hotels in the town where all these servicemen, these new recruits are, are piling in. And he goes in there and he, and he um, uh, basically wanders through the town, goes to the bars, goes to the restaurants, talk to the guy. Here's the, the, the chief of staff, the United States Army, the most important guy probably at that time in the country in terms of the military. And he's wandering around in bars, talking to the soldiers, trying to figure out where they, what's bothering them. He gets a letter about it's, this sounds like trivia, but it's, it's exactly the opposite. Some guy writes him a letter saying, the, the stakes at the, ba the base where he is, they're lousy. 
And he writes, the marshal writes to the head of the base, or the commander of the base and says, check this guy out. If he's, if he's making this up, punish him. But if he's, if he's right, um, fix the stakes. So the other thing a marshal realizes is that these army, this armies are now sequestered in these bases. And he's got to build this huge series of maneuvers, these huge series of, of, of mock war. And they're like nothing this country has ever seen before or since. And people have more or less forgotten about them. Uh, but the first one's in Tennessee and it's huge. And they send huge numbers of troops into these places. Uh, and, they're, and they're set up as war games, huge war games that take place over weeks and, and months in some cases uh, involving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men. The three major maneuvers by the end of the of the years involved 800,000 men. The Louisiana maneuvers, which is the second big maneuver, uh, they've, they've, um, they've, in, they've involved uh, over half a million men in that. And then the final set of maneuvers is over in the Carolinas, uh, the Carol North and South Carolina. Those are the Carolina maneuvers. And this is where we learn, we, uh, they, uh, the Army learns to be the Army. It learns to, uh, it learns to move vast amounts of material in Louisiana. Two million eggs a day. In Louisiana, there, there's no potable water. They have the tanker trucks bringing in water, almost like a, a pipeline made up of trucks. Um, they have to bring in huge amounts of gasoline to fuel the tanks of these big, huge tank exercises. Um, it, it, they're learning logistics. They're learning everything about how to run an army. And, and Eisenhower will say later, after the war in Europe, he said, Without what we, if we hadn't done what we've done in Louisiana, we never would have figured out how to move that much stuff across Europe, because to move it across the country into Louisiana or to the Carolinas was 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 the warm up, was the was the dress rehearsal. So so Marshall has created these huge dress rehearsals, and there's a there, the the other the at the same time. There's this resistance, this 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 dramatic resistance on the part of the America Firsters and the isolationists. And there's a day, there's one day in um, August 12th, 1941, there's a bill up before Congress, before the House of Representatives to uh, keep the men in, who have been drafted, who were drafted initially for one year, to keep them for longer, to keep them in, in, the, in a uniform longer. And uh, if that bill had passed, it failed, uh, hundreds of thousands of men would have started to be sent home before Pearl Harbor. But the bill passes, and the bill passes 203 to 202. There's this moment, August 12th, when perhaps the whole course of the war is, to, is, is decided. Because even Marshall says after the war that if they, if they had sent all those troops home, if they'd sent all those troops home, uh, it would have, the war might have lasted for another couple of years and there might have been hundreds of thousands of more deaths. Um, and the, 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 the story, which I tell in great detail in the book of this, of this vote, where the, where we, where we, the 204 to 203 vote is, um, is an amazing story. And um, it involves Sam Rayburn and it involves uh, Lyndon Johnson and involves a little bit of trickery. Uh, it, there is a moment of, of where the people who wanted to stop the draft or wanted to stop these men from being uh, taking them out of uniform um, could be were quite quite angry. It was had to do with a quick vet gavel. The gavel may have gone down uh, more quickly than it should have, but uh, everything was safe. At the same time, there's a, there's another parallel universe sort of going on at the same time which is the United States is developing this extraordinary culture uh, for the GIs. Some of it is done through the movies. Some of it's done through Marshall. Marshall has this great sense of morale and of keeping his men uh, happy and keeping, not happy, but, but dedicated. And you're realizing these are not professional soldiers. These are guys that really don't wanna be there. Uh, these are, they are literally citizen soldiers, which is the original, some of the early thinking in America about not having a standing army, but having citizen soldiers. And he does these extraordinary things. For example, before Pearl Harbor, before Pearl Harbor, um, 
Marshall recruits Frank Capra, the great, great movie director. He, he, he recruits him to make the propaganda films, which he will, he will show to the troops. Called, it's a series of films, which you can see today on YouTube, called Why We Fight. But this was the genius of Marshall. He didn't just go for some guy. He went for the best single guy in Hollywood. The other thing that was going on in this thing was extraordinary acts of uh, courage and, 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 and uh, by the American people, by, by guys. I mean, the two most famous, Jimmy Stewart, who's probably the most high, the highest paid actor in the world. He's just made these extraordinary movies. I mean, um, Jimmy Stewart is turned down for the draft. He's so furious. They draft him and they say, you're too skinny. He's so furious that he goes to the studio where he was uh, an actor and he got, got this guy to fatten him up and he goes back and gets in. John F. Kennedy is turned down. Pre who becomes president? John F. Kennedy is turned down. He's furious. He tries again. He try, he tries this, and he's got too many physical ailments and stuff. He finally gets his doctor, I mean, his, his father, rather, Joe Kennedy, to get a doctor in Cambridge to say he's okay to go into service and he gets him into, gets him into naval intelligence. But there, these were people of great means, of great of, of struggle, uh, of importance in this culture who fought their way to the draft. Hank Greenberg, the great baseball player. Greenberg is drafted really early, but maybe the greatest slugger of all times. Um, and, and, and every one that every bit is in the same league with DiMaggio and, and, and others. Um, and, and he's drafted early. He's let out because of his age. He's let out just before Pearl Harbor. He's been in for over a year and a half. He's, he, he's, he's let out the Friday before Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor occurs, he signs back up, goes right back in the Monday after Pearl Harbor. He signs up again. And this is the, these are people, and, and th these are just the most famous ones. These are the ones whose la ends up, are, names are up in lights. But there's this other there's this other factor as well. Um, the, 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 what, the, what happens with these guys is they're ready to fight. They 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 go to Europe. They they start in North Africa. Uh, many of these men will go to the South Pacific. Others will go to Europe. They will go with under under um, with the with the tank groups and uh, with Patton George C. Patton, who's another one of these people from the maneuver. Um, and this all takes place, this, they, they, they're ready to fight the Nazis on the ground, and they do. They're not, they get beaten up at first, but they're there. They've got, they've got the, 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 the ability, they've got the morale, they've got the, the leadership. Because one of the things that Marshall did, even during the, the uh, maneuvers, was one of the things, the extraordinary thing about Marshall was he had this vision of what should be, what is, was right. So in October, November of 41, just before Pearl Harbor, he purges. And he hated the word. He purges the army of the misfit uh, officers, of the alcoholics, of the, of the, of the generals and colonels who, who did, can't get along with their men, men. Men were preoccupied with something other than winning the war. He pushes them aside, pushes, somebody gets out of the army, somebody pushes into less uh, dramatic places like supply depots. And in their place, he brings up this cohort he brings up this brilliant cohort of young officers, Dwight D. Eisenhower, George Patton, um, Vinegar, Vinegar Joe Stilwell, Mark Clark, Omar Bradley. He brings all of these guys, these are his guys. Two weeks after Pearl Harbor, he brings Eisenhower, he's never been met. He brings Eisenhower to Washington to be one of the people in his war planning uh, bureau. He sees why Eisenhower is one of the great leaders of the war. He sees him at that early as one of the great planners, one of the great, for lack of a better word, intellectuals of the war. So he's done these extraordinary things. He started an officer candidate school, Marshall had. So we see this genius. And, and I, you know, somebody said the other day as a gag, they said, some of these statues they're tearing down, they should put up statues of George Marshall because you can argue that he won the war for us. Uh, or for the Allies, rather, he, he did that. He became Secretary of State, under which he um, he started the Marshall Plan, which saved Europe. You could argue that he saved Europe twice, uh, and he became won the Nobel Peace Prize. From here. Um, and uh, an extraordinary figure uh, when you look at it. But also the others that that come alive in my book. I mean, one of the things I uh, 
enjoyed the most was writing about Eisenhower, writing about uh, Omar Bradley, writing about these guys when they were still you know, below the grades of generals, when nobody, nobody heard about them. The first time Eisenhower's name appears in one of the big newspapers, they call him Eisenstein or something. They, they, they mess up his name. You know, they don't even get his name right. Um, and uh, so it, to me, it's just an, an amazing story that we, there's a miracle, we, uh, what we did and what happened. And I enjoyed just doing all of it. There's one, there's one sort of um, the negative side, the counter narrative, which I stage very carefully in the book uh, and which we can discuss as we do questions in me, was the struggle uh, on the part of African-Americans for, for equality and for integration uh, in the armed forces. And it's an extraordinary struggle, which I paint all the way through the book and even bring up through the, the Truman uh, uh, integration order in, in uh, right, right before the Korean War. Uh, but he, the, the, the African Americans who, are, who are, act bravely, who are treated badly during the whole war uh, and still perform magnificently in many, many cases. And um, this is a struggle that, um, this is the, the saddest part of the book, but it also had, there's redemption uh, at the end. Uh, the army becomes more and more integrated, even after Truman orders the integration. Uh, that integration, he doesn't have the teeth. He doesn't have the, he can't really push it through. So it takes Eisenhower and Kennedy and following presidents to actually enforce the integration. And 50 years after, 50 years after the Truman Edict, uh, Secretary of Defense Cohen, who was then the Secretary of Defense, former Senator from Maine, um, Secretary of Defense Cohen says, that in the, 50 years later, he says, the Army is now the model for integration in American life. He didn't say it was finished, it wasn't done, but he said it was the best example you could find of an element of American life and integration. So this is really a story. My story is an epic. I, I think of it as an epic of building this extraordinary army, high morale. Um, they were wisecracking guys. I'll give you one example when they, these guys start to show up in South Carolina or in, the, in Louisiana and, and the, uh, uh, Tennessee and the Carolinas. They can't, they, they, they can't get over these guys because as soon as you show them a Jeep, which is brand new then, or a tank or an aircraft, the first thing these guys wanted to do because who they were growing up in the depression, they want to get under the hood and start pulling spark plugs and start seeing if they can make the engine work better. The other thing was amazing, and this sounds so silly you know, on its face, but these guys could read maps. And one of the problems in World War I was very few people really know how to read maps. They could read a map of the world that's so where China was, but they couldn't read a, a, a regular old map, a, a, a top, topographic map or a local map. And so what happened was uh, these guys had grown up on gas station roadmaps. Uh, they were, you know, they, 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 they were familiar with all this stuff. And uh, it, it, they were an amazing, if somebody accused me of that being of the, of the greatest generation school of, of writing. And uh, meaning that I, that I perhaps as a, as a dig, but I actually took it as a compliment because I, the more I read about these guys and the more I studied them and the more I saw how they behaved and the more how they reacted to pressure, uh, the more impressed I became that they were a, a, a different breed. And they were, and a lot of them were deficient. One of the great things that comes out of the, the draft is they realize huge numbers of these people, these men, have mineral vitamin deficiencies, they have problems, they have physical deficiencies, they have tremendous problems with their teeth. And immediately you know, the government starts pushing all of these elements, riboflavin, iron, niacin, uh, all these things, uh, they start pushing them into bread. And so all of us grew up, I think most, all of us did, just about all of us did, uh, grew up on enriched flour. And that was basically to prevent huge uh, uh, problems with, 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 uh, with, uh, disease and, and, and uh, deprivation and, and lacking certain key minerals, lack of iron, lack of zinc. And so um, the, this, this period to me was interesting because things like that happened, which today, if somebody says, well, the government wants us to put niacin in our cereal, 
the evil is paying them. Don't stop them. I'm a libertarian. Don't let me, you know, this is an infringement on my liberty. I don't want to be niacin, even if it's just, well, I'm getting a home. I'm a, I'm a, so it's probably time for me to, to let, um, <laughs> let the world take over. Hey, Paul. Yes. Um, I was fascinated by, by the bread minerals um, tangent, but we do have a lot of really great questions in the docket. Um, so I'll start asking them. Um, Tim Stevens asks, was the peace movement at the start of World War I different, um, meaning stronger, more or less ethnically diverse, more women um, now voters than the movement before World War II? Um, was the peace movement, like in what ways was the peace movement of the, at the start of World War I different than that um, at the start of World War II? It was probably stronger world during World War One. I'm not. A, I haven't really studied that, but it was remarkably limited. Uh, the peace movement in America at the as we went into the war was pretty much uh, theologians, people whose religions, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and others, who don't fight in any war. In fact, the Nazis killed many of them for that very reason. Um, uh, but it wasn't widespread. It was. It, it wasn't. This, there were conscientious objectors. Uh, but they, but it wasn't a major movement. The major, mo the most interesting movement, which was a group of kids before the war, well before the war, at Princeton called the Veterans of Future Wars, which are about a bunch of college kids who are create this prank, more or less a prank. They were they were seeing the World War One veterans get their benefits, so they said, well, let's do this. Let's um let's demand our benefits now before the war starts. And all of a sudden, this prank or this this exercise, I think. One guy wrote it for a government paper, this creating this organization, spreads through the whole country, state universities, Jesuit colleges, Ivy League colleges, not Ivy League colleges, all jump aboard. And then at Vassar, which is all women at that point, it's the, the, the future gold star mothers, meaning for, you know, women wanting compensation for losing their children in the war. Um, and it, and, and, and that, was, uh, it was, it was, that was a big deal at the time uh, I trace these guys through the whole book because they're just perfect characters. They're almost like New Yorker uh, people um, in, in terms of their interests in there. And, and they all they all they all go in the war and they all they all fight except for one fellow who was was wounded uh, in a, a traffic accident. But it wasn't it, it wasn't as it wasn't as fierce. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, and as a as a Princeton grad, I, I really do love that future war that is a future war story. Um, Wallace says um, very early in the book, you write that Harry Hopkins supported Marshall and lobbied for his appointment as chief military advisor. Can you say a little bit more about their relationship? I, I it, Hopkins felt that um, he could see through the guy. There was a huge number of people lobbying to be chief of staff including a guy named Hugh Drum, who was lobbying so hard that Roosevelt would walk around the White House and say, drum, 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 will he stop beating his drum, drum. And others who were actively lobbying. And Hopkins saw very early on in some of the meetings when, when Marshall was in a lower position and began to see just the, the genius he was. And the fact that he wasn't going to be uh, a yes man, that the last thing Roosevelt, Roosevelt knew this too, the last thing Roosevelt needed in his army guy was somebody to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, that's a good idea. And he stood up to Roosevelt, even as a much lower, in a lower position. He also kept his distance, which is fascinating. At one point, Roosevelt, President of the States says to this, uh, this colonel, he says, uh, George, and, and, and Marshall bristles and says, no, no. Uh, you can either call me Patton, I mean, just call me Marshall, or call me uh, my, my rank, but 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 don't call me George. And it was and the whole room is hushed. It's like this moment of the he just told the president not to call him by his first name, but it established his his ability to to to, to run this war. And as later, I mean, and Hopkins is 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 basically his big, biggest uh, um, pushing the hardest. Pershing is another one, General Pershing. In the First World War, he's very, he's convinced that, that Marshall is the greatest possible possibility. Fabulous. Um, 
So uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how would you compare the Army's preparedness for World War II to the Navy? The Navy had a fairly significant fleet of carriers and battleships on December 6, 1941. So I get the impression that the Navy was much better prepared. It, well, it's, it's a hard, it's like comparing you know, land to sea. They're two different, they're two different worlds. The, the Navy never lost its strength. Roosevelt himself was a Navy man. The isolationists believed in a very strong Navy. They didn't really care about, the, they didn't really imagine any kind of land war, but they needed this powerful Navy. So the Navy was, the Navy was in good shape. There were, there were at the, the day of Pearl Harbor, the exact numbers I think were, the Navy had, the Army had 1.4 million troops and the Navy had about 400,000. The Navy was in good shape. Um, whether it was well led, that's another question. And it comes up with Pearl Harbor and other things, but it was, uh, the, the Navy was much stronger, mm -hmm. but, it, but the army had come from zero to 70 and the, and the Navy was already at 60, you know. So sure, kind of sure. Um, before we move on, we just got a lovely comment in the chat from Emil Frankel. Uh, they say, Paul, proud of your achievements. Enjoyed the presentation and look forward to reading the book. Emil Frankel, Wesleyan, class of 61. Classmate, um, yes. Wanted to note that, yeah. Thank um, you. Next Thank question. You. H. Perry Chapman says, Paul, you tell a story of such impressive competence and leadership. Was there something about the period um, around 1940 that fostered the possibility of strong individual leadership in the service of this country? What was in the water? I, I you know, that's a phenomenal question. And it's a question I struggled with the whole time. Why, why were these so, guys so good? I mean, they weren't great scholars. I mean, Marshall couldn't get into West Point. I mean, you got, he went to VMI. Um, the, the, and, and, you know, they, they'd had mediocre careers up to that point. Eisenhower was a couple times, one time one was going to leave the army. Um, uh, Patton was a, uh, had his own life, of, you know, as a socialite. He was a, the horsemen and, and they, they had all these other things going on uh, and they all rose to this. And I, 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 it's hard for me to figure out what made them so much different. Part of it was Marshall had this, I, I think one of the most extraordinary things about Marshall was he was up against some really, um, I, I think of a better word than dumb, but members of Congress would ask them these stupid questions and, and try to trap him and try to do this. And Bernard Baruch, the great, um, financier who was advisor to Roosevelt was also an advisor to Marshall. And Mar he wrote to Marshall, he says, how can you keep your temper? How can you, I found this letter, it's in the Marshall archives. <clears throat> he said, how did you keep your temper during all this? How do you, why didn't you blow up with those, at those guys for these stupid questions and, and for these antagonistic questions? And Marshall said, essentially he said, it's, I got to save the country. I can't let the country go down the tubes because these guys are being, um, what's, the, what's the technical word for dorks? You know? But these guys were being, these guys were, and, 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 and it was just, and he said, at one point he told, says the broke, he said, wait till after the war, 1947. He's in an interview and he finally blows up because all these people are fighting in like Life Magazine, The Time, The Loose Empire. All these people are, are, are behind the Chicago Tribune, a bunch of senators are all, uh, all be, all are, are part of the isolationism, including, and led by Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh. And, and he just, he's boiling, but he's got to keep his temper. He's got to keep it flat and to the point. Mm -hmm. Eye on the prize, like the civil rights people. Sure, sure. Um, next question from John Miles. Paul, did your research include materials detailing the state of the army at the beginning of World War I and how we got up to snuff for entry into that war in 1918? Um, yeah, you know, I didn't do a lot of work on that. It was, it was a, we had, a, we had more time to prepare. It was a peacetime draft. We relied heavily on, on, on immigrants. Uh, if you really look at the numbers, the number of people didn't even uh, speak English. And we trained our officers. This fellow Glenville Clark was involved. We took a lot of Ivy League and high-end college uh, graduates and turned them into officers in 90 days in something called the Plattsburgh Plan. Um, there was a great, a lot of people thought it was very successful. Marshall, who was there, 
under Patton in World War I felt these guys weren't ready. Uh, and one of the reasons that made him such a good uh, uh, person for the World War II was, was, uh, was, was Marshall, who changed the whole way of fighting. I mean, I, I'm running over these big, big things that he did. And in World War I, it was a different kind of fighting. It was, it was trench warfare. It was, it was cannon fodder. I mean, the idea of World War I is you raise a huge army so they can be ca literally cannon fodder. And, and Marshall started changing the arrangements of divisions. So there'd be flanks and there'd be, they went through these triangular divisions. So it wasn't, there were, there were, there were groups of specialists out there. Um, so I, you know, again, I'm not sure the, com the comparison was that the second world war, they learned an awful lot from the mistakes in the first. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Um, so Jim Carr asks, I, I like this question a lot. Um, if you had guests at the soon to be dedicated Eisenhower Memorial, what points about Eisenhower would you emphasize? Um, actually, I am, a, I, I have been invited to be there because I've worked a lot. My last three books, uh, or my last three big nonfiction books, Eisenhower has made a, a major role. And so I've gotten to know him and going from being sort of like, well, he was a nice fellow uh, and won the war and was a, played a lot of golf when he was president. I've learned that he's probably the most remarkable, along with, with Marshall and Churchill and, and Roosevelt, among the truly remarkable people of, world, of, of the 20th century. And even his early civil rights work, uh, in, in terms of, which is, which is quite impressive, if you, you know, there's a, a new book on that topic of, of his imp impact on civil rights. But um, in terms of this book, what, he, what they really see in Eisenhower, in the Louisiana maneuvers, is this tremendous ability to get along with his men, to get along with the, with the, with the, with the press, to get along with the other officers, to be low key. Uh, the, the, these guys, these newspaper guys would be down these, these radio people and they couldn't understand what was going on. I could bring him the tent. He said, you want a, you want a, you want a, a coffee or, or a shot of booze? And he'd sit down and explain. And these other, they come out and they say, this guy can explain it. The other thing was he had this extraordinary ability with, uh, with his men. And I think that's what's, what Marshall saw. There also he had this tactical, strategic, logistic intelligence. He had the whole package. He was like a baseball player having all the tools, you know, fielding, hitting, everything. He had all the tools. And in the, uh, but on top of it, he was this sort of down to earth guy who could, who wrote amazing uh, uh, things from his from his men, and uh, there's a great example. Of Louisiana, he sent to, as a chief of staff in Louisiana, he sent to go and look into this. There's a chef out there who's cooking with with spices, and there's complaints that he's not cooking by the army cookbook, and that, you know, and he's cooking with saffron, and he's cooking with oregano, and all this stuff. And Ike, who's a famous, you know, whose hobby is cooking all his life. He goes down to, theoretically to punish this guy and tell him to get more. And they become best friends, not best friends, but he, he says, oh, they're swapping. They go, how do you do this? And how do you, how come your meatballs are so good kind of stuff? And Eisenhower then, after the war is over, he brings this, this chef who's re-enlisted, brings them to Europe to, to, during the occupation of Germany and during the you know, building of NATO. And, uh, but that's the kind of touch he had, you know? He, he finds a chef, you know. That's lovely. Um, another question about Eisenhower. Um, Thomas Mann asks, I believe you mentioned that right after Pearl Harbor, Eisenhower was making major decisions on troop movements, decisions that were above his pay grade. Uh, and this is exactly what Marshall was looking for in officers. Can you talk a bit more about Eisenhower's quick rise? Uh, I, I, well, I, I think it was basically what he did. I think it was basically Louisiana and some of the writing he'd done. He was, he was very advanced in thinking, in his thinking. He wrote at one point later that there was a point in the army where if you were anti-horse, meaning anti-cavalry, and in favor of the armored cavalry, which are tanks, it was the same, the same divisions, uh, or may, many of them were. I, I think a lot of his writing, a lot of his just ability to, 
be there when the when and in a leadership position. But again, it wasn't major. It just was. I think he just saw in this guy, who was, had been a chief of staff in Louisiana, of one of the big armies, uh, just a very smart guy, a, a guy who had had, had this. And like I, I, again, I, there's a there's a magic thing in there. I don't fully understand. But Marshall had a little black book, which we find out wasn't really a black book. It was a piece of of his brain, and he had Eisenhower's name down there. It's one of the future guys. Fabulous. Um, I I really liked um, Norbert Kreisch's, uh question. Paul, were there members from the Bonus Army who ended up in ser serving in World War II, or were most of them too old or too disenchanted after how they'd been treated? Um, the, most of them, many of them came to World War II through the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And the civilian concept, and, and there a lot of the bonus guys, that was the only way they could get out of poverty and such. And a lot of them were older by then. A lot of them uh, participated in the war. But one of the things that came out of the war, the CCC, hundreds of thousands of men, some of whom are in desperate shape. There, some of them are literally hoodlums. They're they're running loose on the highways. They're they're in gangs. They're they're not the you know they're guys who are desperate. They don't have any money. They don't have any food, and they're brought in. And they're turned into disciplined uh, forces. They're turned into, uh, they can drill, they can do this, they can follow orders, they can command other men. And, and I say men because it's all male. male. Um, and uh, they, they become, Mark Clark says after the war, they became the backbone of the, um, of the non-commissioned officers, the sergeant corps in the World War II. And they have, may have helped win the war. And another huge bunch of the CCC guys who would come out with literally a diploma for their good work over, over a certain period of time. They ended up as being factory supervisors and aircraft plants. They, be, they had this sort of, the, they became sort of the blue collar, for lack of a better term, the blue collar leadership as the war was fought. And so the bonus army guys sort of merged into this whole story, uh, but it was the effect of the, uh, the, the uh, was the, the actual effect of the bonus army and what had happened in World War I that on the day of the D-Day invasion, a lot of the people left over from the bonus army and knew all about it, the American Legion and other places, uh, they start the GI Bill of Rights, the GI Bill, which, which ch changes the whole face of the country in terms of pro personal property, education, uh, starting businesses. And unlike World War I, they just dumped these guys on the streets and said, go home, here's your uniform and 50 bucks or something. These guys, these guys came out and that was the influence of those World War I guys. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry, I was muted. We have a very special question from a very special person. Barbara Mead, um, founding owner of Politics and Prose asks, hi, Barbara. Uh, hi, Barbara. Uh, how much did it change our country to have such a large number of young men toughened from their march through Louisiana, Tennessee, and the Carolinas, and then the war, return to civilian life? Lovely question. I, I, I think the impact of it is something we're still feeling. I think a lot of things happened with that group uh, be, and, and with, the, with the catalyst of the GI Bill. People who got... Um, Many of, the, many of the black civil rights leaders that went to law school under the GI Bill, Thurgood Marshall included. Um, many of our great scientists went to, went to graduate school under the GI Bill and, or, or went to college and became the very beginnings of the biotechnology movement. Uh, the very people, the engineers and scientists who put the United States on the moon, many of them were, were older men who and women who had gotten uh, the, their money and their education and their start through the GI Bill. Uh, but it was also the, their, their determination. It was a tough war. It was a terrible war. There's nothing going to, my book is sort of lighthearted in a sense because there are no casualties. There's no, it's all about, you know, guys training and, and you know, being afraid of snakes in Louisiana or something. But, but, but it, was, it was a horrible war. And most people I knew that were there, my uncles included, really never want to talk about it. You, uh, if they've never seen combat, it was very common. 
and they were they were an extraordinary group. I don't know if it's fair to say that they were the Jenners were the greatest generation, but I'd I'd be hard pressed to argue against that. But thank you, Barbara. And I know Barbara was Barbara got an early copy of the book, and she was sending me early emails saying, you know, "This is I really like this." Great. So I'm one of her greatest fans, and I think it may be vice versa. Amazing. Um, we will take a, a question from YouTube now. Um, Christopher Ferguson would like to ask, is there any evidence of Axis efforts to support the US isolationist movement prior to the war? You, I think you missed a word there. Was it the Nazi? Uh... Uh, Axis efforts. Oh, Axis. I, yes. I didn't hear Sorry. Axis. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was, there was, there was significant. And there were some that were actually getting to members of Congress and supporting them in certain ways. Um, and there was also a great, um, the, and I think a lot of the failure of the America First movement eventually uh, went down in flames. And one of the main reasons was Lindbergh gave this infamous, I say infamous speech in, uh, in, in the fall of 1941. Um, attacking American Jews as a separate nation almost, saying that the people who want us to go to war are the British, the New Dealers, and the American Jewish population. And it blew up in his face an extraordinary. His wife tried to convince him not to give the speech. The guy that was carrying his, his um, speeches on radio was a guy named Bamberger. Bamberger owned the Mutual Radio Network. What, I, what he didn't understand, there were Jews who were in the American uh, uh, first movement, but it, but when it, what, when he got a hold of it, it turned into sort of an, an anti-Semitic screed with all the tropes of anti-Semitism, and it was, it was, it was pretty much all over. I mean, it was, it was, it went off the map entirely at Pearl Harbor, but it took the wind out of him. It took it when Lindbergh, Lindbergh just couldn't keep his mouth shut, uh, and he, he thought he was God, and he was. I keep, sorry. Uh, I think we'll take about two or three more questions. Um, there are so many great ones in here, uh, but we just, we just unfortunately don't have time. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, if the US was not as well prepared to fight in Europe, is it safe to say that the Red Army would have overrun all of Europe, given that the Soviets fought the vast majority of the Wehrmacht? Uh, Wow, that may be out above my pay grade, as they say. Okay. Uh, I, I do know that we, we were, what we did was pretty spectacular because we, and there was a big divide of, as to where they're going to go immediately to France. But I, I don't think they could have done what we did. They could have gone, they could have gone west, but we came out, I mean, don't forget the, the major, the first push was not in Normandy. Our major first push was getting all those troops to North Africa. And they were bringing them, they were hidden in Northern Ireland, they were hidden in Bermuda, they were hidden in Newfoundland, to get this huge army with all these tanks across the Atlantic Ocean into North Africa. And we land all these troops, and there's some debacles, there's some bad battles where we lose a lot of men. But we fight our way across North Africa, and we come up through Sicily, and we come up through Italy, and we come into Central Europe. And then the other side, we've got the, you know, got the, and I don't think, I, I think coming out of Russia, or uh, it would have been a lot different uh, situation, I think, than that. Fair. Um, Ken Myers asks, why were states like Louisiana chosen for training sites? And also he asks from the photo behind you, who is your favorite Robinson, Brooks, or Frank? Oh, man. No, both of those guys. Are you kidding? <laughs> Are you kidding? What did Earl Weaver said? He said, what do you want in the team? He said, a bunch of guys, then Robinson. I mean, the great story about, I, I deferred the, uh, any baseball people aboard. But one of the great things about, about uh, the Robinsons was that um, uh, Brooks was at Central High School when it was integrated, when they sent the 171st Airborne in there. And yet he was... As close to as close to Frank, who is black and he's white, as as a as a as a true brother. At least that's what those guys always said. So uh, 
Well, why forget the question other than? Oh, uh, the question was, sorry, I'll, I'll get it back. Sorry. No, 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 you're fine. Um, oh, why were states like Louisiana chosen as training sites? The vast, vast open spaces, vast places that would replicate war in other parts of the world, that the jungles of, uh, I say jungles, but the, the swamps and the, 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 the hinterlands of Louisiana, the water, water soaked, bore ridden, snake ridden, inhospitable parts of Louisiana. Uh, the, the, a lot of the Carolinas maneuvers were done in the mountains. A lot of the Tennessee was, and that was done in the fall, sort of, that sort of replicated a lot of Europe, Switzerland, et cetera. Um, but the idea was to, to, to create maneuvers. Uh, and then there was one final maneuver in early 41 in the desert of, of which was the Paris for the going into North Africa, um, run by Patton. Excellent. Um, and then uh, one more before I ask you for your summer book recommendation. Um, what uh, can the subject of your book teach us about our the current times we're living through? Um, what do you think, what light does your book have to shed on, on our, our present day? I think two major points. Um, one is uh, Americans were willing to sacrifice. And, and, and one of the perfect metaphors is when all these guys are drafted, hundreds of thousands of people are yanked out of their lives as citizens thrown into these camps, what do, the, what do they have to do? Almost the first thing you have to do in basic training is learn how to use a gas mask. Now, the, the mask, all of a sudden the mask becomes a, a mission. But these guys didn't go, I'm, my liberties are being, uh, this is totalitarian to tell me I got to go in the draft. There was none of that. I and mean, there was some of it, but it wasn't like, it is now with this massive resistance. It was, it was like, you know, we've got to pull together. We're not going to make it if we don't pull together. And it's so obvious that the masks and the economy are, are, are linked. And it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. The other is what Roosevelt and the, re and, and, and the other leaders, and, and there, were, there were Republicans too, so it wasn't just a democratic thing, and, there, and a number of them, realized they had to, in order to win the war, in order to prevail, in order to get the country out of the depression, which is part of the whole package of what was going on at the same time, they had to compromise, they had to cross the aisle, they had to take from each other the best thoughts. And it's so, it's so obvious that that's what, that was part of the, the success. And having leaders who were, who were genuinely interested in America. I mean, one of the things about Grenville Clark, I mentioned this attorney, very rich man, very influential, he was murdered in World War I. He starts the draft. He literally, one man army. Late in life, he becomes a great, great contributor to the NAACP Legal and Education Defense Fund and also uh, helps support many of the efforts of Martin Luther King. So you see these people, these powerful people who love this country to the extent that they wanted to make it a better place. And they, it's so obvious we need those. We need those men and women today. Uh, let's, those yeah. are the lessons. I, I think those are beautiful, important, important lessons um, that are great takeaways from your book. Um, so I do have one last question for you, and that's what are you reading right now? I am halfway through, and this is this is a neighbor and a friend, but uh, Lawrence Roberts, Larry Roberts, who also lives in Garrett Park, which is one of the Literary centers of the universe right now. Uh, uh, and he, uh, sorry about that. And um, it's a wonderful book. And I was here in 71. I lived at my wife and I lived on California Street. We were here during all the anti Vietnam uh, protests. And, and I'm only halfway through it, but I'll tell you, he captures things that were going on then that those of us were journalists. I was a journalist at that point and covering, you know, in the middle of everything, not including the marches, but that we didn't understand at the time. We didn't realize the, the venality of certain people. We didn't realize that uh, it's giving us, it's putting part of our lives in, in, um, in focus. And he's, and he's a beautiful, strong writer, and it's a great narrative. 
Um, and I so what's, I recommend it. What's the title of that book? Mayday, or can you see? Oh, I got there it is. Mayday. Oh, Mayday. 1971. 1971. Here's the cover. Fabulous. I just put the link Here's to my that book as well. Yes. <laughs> um, well, Paul, thank you so much. This was a thoroughly enjoyed, um, wonderful conversation. Um, we wish you the best of luck with the rest of your book launch. And I want to thank everybody for coming here tonight. Um, again, you can go to Politics and Prose's website and buy Paul's book tonight. Um, I hope you do because it's also, it's those book sales right now that are keeping our doors open in this very difficult time. Um, so I thank you, Paul, for, for bringing all your friends here this evening. And I thank everybody for showing up. Thank you. Absolutely. Stay well and stay well read, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.